This is the Growing Farms Podcast with John Siskovich, episode number 81. Welcome to the Growing Farms Podcast, where farmers come together to talk shop. Whether you've been farming for years, you're a homegrown greenhorn, or you're starting to consider a career in agriculture, there is something we can all do to grow our farms. Hello there, friends and farmers. Welcome to episode number 81 of the Growing Farms Podcast. Naming this one, Building on the Shoulders of Giants. I have a really good topic for you today, and I have a really special guest for you today. Bringing on the podcast here, Curtis Stone from Green City Acres up in Canada. This dude has been doing a podcast with Diego Footer of Permaculture Voices. Diego's now, you know, I would say I would say a good friend of mine. Diego's a pretty solid dude. And uh, I have been, that's one of the podcasts that I've just been eating up this summer. So if you want a resource highlight, Permaculture Voices podcast, whenever you see TUF, The Urban Farmer, in the beginning, that's always a good episode. And not like, oh yeah, they're usually pretty good. It's always a good episode. So he's coming on the show. He's gonna, we're gonna make it a two-parter because he had a lot of wisdom to share. And uh, me and him have a lot in common. Maybe that's why I like him. <laughs> Anyways, so building on the shoulders of giants, today's podcast episode. Curtis and I in our interview are gonna go into kind of our backstory on how we got into farming and some of the ideals that we shared and journeys that we took. Uh, it was really good and fun to listen back to as I had just re-listened to it before recording this part of the episode. But uh, I want to talk about this building on the shoulders of giants. It was one of the discussions that we had with disseminating information on the internet, um, in particular the internet. You know, there's books, there's YouTube, there's DVDs that you can buy. I don't know who's buying DVDs still, eh, especially with YouTube. It's amazing. Uh, <laughs> And there's just so much information out there, and there's so many great farmers now beginning to share that information. And you may remember from episode three of Farm Fantasy Camp, Talking Nonsense, that we discussed this a little bit. And I wanted to, you know, it's been on my mind since the podcast went on hiatus to expand upon this a little bit. And, you know, I, I said some stuff in that episode, if you want to listen back, uh, that's Farm Fantasy Camp, episode three talking nonsense, that, you know, I said some things that, you know, I, I don't think came across as, across as clear as I would like them to have. And in particular, I put Joel Salton in the crosshairs, and having never personally talked to the guy, I felt really dumb about, about that. Because I want to, you know, I think the guy's amazing. And it's not the information he's putting out because the information he's putting out is good and accurate and valuable and has been very helpful to me. It is your own personal perception of what that information might be. And it's not just Joel, but it's anything that you read online. And I want to very much include any of the information, podcasts, YouTube videos, blog posts that I put out on farm marketing solutions. Because... You know, one of my most popular videos on YouTube is how to start a farm with no money. And what the video really boils down to is that you have to work real hard, be really lucky, and, you know, make your own luck uh, and just be clean, be organized, and work really hard, and good things will happen. And that's how you start a farm with no money. And more fun than that video, which I shot at the very beginning of my farming career. Uh, is the comment section below because it's so many people calling out some of the things that are nonsense in that video. Like, oh, this is not how to start a farm with no money. This is how to start a farm with some money or a little bit of money or using somebody else's money. Because there are so many different iterations of how you can do things and how those things can be applied to your farm and how you're going to react. Even year to year, that same exact task can be refined and iterated and changed and adapted to whatever you're doing on your farm. And with the information that Curtis puts out, that Diego puts out, that Scott and I put out here on Farm Marketing Solutions, take that and take away from it the concepts uh, that we're talking about. Not specifically like, oh, you're going to get $6 a pound for your pastured poultry chicken 
if you start a pastured poultry farm using my chicken tractors in a very similar way, you know, your market might not support that. Uh, I just visited a friend, my friend Troy in New York, and the the pasture raised poultry at, in his air, neck of the woods was like half the price that mine is raised in very much the same way. So it's all depending on what your market can support. And that's only found out through trial and error, testing, making mistakes, learning, taking notes, going back, reviewing those notes. Farming, that's that's the hard part about farming. When you think about har- farming being hard, the, Im- the immediate image that used to be drawn into my brain when I was first starting out was, you know, hoeing fields and weeding and working in the sun and rain or snow or sun or whatever, you know, you're out there working. And that's that's become the easy part for me. I know how to make things grow. Uh, I really, really, really love my field time because the difficult part is the data tracking and analysis of what you're doing, the marketing, the sales, the business stuff, the regulations, filling out forms. Oh, now your neighbor called because you're on this wetland or now you've done this or you want to do this, but you can't get into that market because of this regulation in your state. And why isn't it different? Why is it different than the state next to you? And oh God, it makes you so, you just want to go outside and weed because the office stuff is the most difficult. Well, that office stuff that's difficult is only difficult because maybe you're perceiving it to be difficult and it's not something that you actually want to do. But that's what I'm focusing on throughout this winter. Now that my production is slowing down here on Camps Road Farm, I want to take those office tasks and break them down. Am am I doing things efficiently? Am I doing them effectively? Am I putting enough? You know, I, I have a website called Farm Marketing Solutions. Am I doing enough farm marketing for me to sell my products? You know, am I overproducing? I've, I found this really, really good book, and I think Curtis and I mention it uh, maybe in the next episode that'll be coming out, uh, The Lean Farm by Ben Hartman. This book is blowing my mind. Uh, I just put out a video where I cleaned out my, my workshop to make it more organized to find my tools, and that is something that I'll be applying all over farm because the you know, the sexy part about farming is producing this food, and then you can eat this food, and you give it to chefs, and then you're, you're, you're you know, hopefully... Your farm is on the menu and it's really great and people are eating your stuff. For me, the really sexy part of all this is the organization and the data tracking and the iterating because now I've, I've had that taste of having my food on people's dinner plates and I want more of it and I want to do it more effectively so that I can, you know, I can run a better business so that I can take a little bit more time off so I can be more efficient and more balanced, not because I want to run the farm like a factory and have everything on an assembly line and have everything, you know, I want to have everything detailed out, but not in the fact of like, you know, taking all the fun out of production. I want to do it because I fit a lot into my day and I don't want to spend any of that time looking for tools or just wasting time with all the the holes in the bottom of the boat. And as you're getting a start in farming, you're going to want to focus on growing the 80 different kinds of plants. And you'll hear from Curtis that growing 80 different kinds of plants is not the solution. Finding the right combination of maybe eight different kinds of plants might be that solution, but that's something that you're going to have to figure out. So how does that, any of that apply to you? Well, because, or how does that, any of that apply to this building on the shoulders of giants? Because now there is more information out there. There are good case studies. You know, there's edible magazines all across the country. There's Mother Earth News. There's Farm Marketing Solutions. There's, you know, Permaculture Voices and all the stuff that Diego's putting out. There's Jack Spierko and the, you know, the Prepper Survival Podcast. There's a lot of good information. And, you know, some of that, what you need to do, or all of it, what you need to do is not take very specifically oh, this is their product and this is their yield. That's what I can expect. You want to take and glean the principles that we're talking about and apply those principles to your farm in your specific situation. And that's what it takes to be a good farmer is not just copying what somebody else has done, but taking what they've done and iterating and building upon it. And then I want to say that with Farm Marketing Solutions, 
It's what I've been doing and through your website or in finding some forum where you're sharing that information, your next iteration forward to the next generation of farmers. Whether that's somebody, you know, I, I put up a video now on YouTube and I'll get a thousand views within the first week, uh, which is crazy to me. You know, that's still not crazy big numbers, but it's still a thousand people who have watched my one of my videos and it depends on the video and stuff. But you know, I get a lot of comments back on people saying, oh, I never thought of that. Let me try that. Or, oh, you know, I see you're struggling with that. Have you ever tried this or that? And there's a conversation going. Us farmers are have tools now that we never had in the past. Even three years ago, there's things that exist today that didn't exist three years ago that make it easier to share information. And I'm hooked on it because Camps Road Farm, if you've been following the Farm Finance Challenge on the Farm Marketing Solutions website, didn't have a really bumper year. Like it wasn't a crazy good year. And I know some of the variables that went into that. And I'm not going to try to condense it in the next couple minutes. But I have I have some work to do. I have to make this place way more efficient. I know that I'm, I'm all right with my numbers for this year. It's got to be what it's got to be because there's not much I can change at this point for 2015. But for 2016, that's what I'm going to be focused on this winter. You know, supporting the brewery and the distillery that's part of come become part of my winter work. And that's more discussion for a future episode. You know, I work for a larger kind of company. It's not a large company, but it's larger than just a mom and pop storefront or a mom and pop farm. You know, I have a couple couple people that I work with and we'll we'll that's for another day. But uh Focusing on this winter, producing what I can, selling what I can, but making sure that 2016 and year to year going forward, I am better every single year. And I really want with 2016 and, you know, finishing strong in 2015, that all goes without saying that I'm not already like, well, 2015, I'm kind of writing it off. I have still have still have stuff to finish for 2015 and that's fine. But I'm already fired up for 2016 because I'm learning all these new principles and I'm sharing them forward and having a lot of conversation with you guys on how exactly I'm implementing all of this stuff, how it's affecting my farm, and then you guys are writing back and sharing how it's affecting your farm, and that is awesome. So I'm fired up. I mean, you can tell uh, I'm getting a little bit more regular sleep. Uh, I have the new... Uh, a really fun experience of throwing my back out twice. That's really cool. But other than that, you know, not feeling, not feel, except for the back thing makes me feel like I'm an old man now, but I'm not, you know, I still have, I still have some good years left in me. Whew. So uh, now that I'm all fired up, I want to introduce Curtis Stone from Green City Acres. Curtis is a guy who's been doing some really smart things with agriculture and sharing some great information as I talk about today's topic, standing on the shoulders of giants or building on the shoulders of giants or whatever the phrase is. Curtis is doing it and he's doing a great job. I want to jump right into the interview. For those of you interested in my update for what has been going on in Camps Road Farm at what I've been up to the last couple of weeks, I will do that at the end of this episode. Wanted to lead right into the interview and then towards the end there, I'm going to tell you about the pigs we just processed and how we did that and then a few other things that I have going on this fall. But right now, that interview with Curtis Stone. So we have here today on the Growing Farm podcast, a guy I met at PV3. Uh, he One of the memorable quotes from meeting Curtis was effing data, uh, having data and capturing information on your farm and running a very efficient farm enterprise. This dude's great. Uh, I've been following him on the Permaculture Voices podcast with Diego Footer, as I've mentioned on the show before, and I'm lucky enough to have him on the other end of Skype, despite many technical difficulties. How are you doing today, Curtis? Good, John. How are you doing? Fantastic. I just, uh, we took our one long weekend for the year, so I'm coming back refreshed and nice. happy, and I've had my vacation, and life is good. Perfect. So, Curtis, for those of us who haven't heard the Urban Farmer on Permaculture Voices or haven't heard of Green City Acres, can you give us a brief overview of who you are and where you're coming from? Yeah, so um, I run a farm called Green City Acres, which is a one-third of an acre multi-locational urban farm in Kelowna, B.C., Canada. And we grow primarily high-value um, kind of exclusively focusing on fast-growing, 
high yield per square foot, high price per pound, long seasonality, and popularity. Those are the main things that I look for in growing crops. I'm sure we can get into that more. Um, but that is what makes my farm profitable. That's what, that's what makes it possible for us to do 75000 or more on a third of an acre in a seven-month growing season. So our primary season is 31 weeks from the first week of April to the end of October. But we do quite a bit of shoulder season farming. We do some microgreen growing during the winter. But we're, we're a pretty specialized farm. I, uh, in the past, I have grown 80 different types of vegetables. I've been up to two and a half acres with eight staff before so our farm has changed sizes over the years but I found the sweet spot for my place and my market streams to be one third of an acre and so that's what I do on the farming end. I also work as a consultant year round helping other farmers um, specialize and focus on fast cash flow um, production systems I run a podcast with Diego Futur called The Urban Farmer each week and we're doing that for each week of my growing season. I have a book coming out called The Urban Farmer, uh, December 29th in all major bookstores. And I run an online course called ProfitableUrbanFarming.com. So that's that's mostly what keeps me busy. So you, you don't have that much going on, do you? <laughs> Not really, no. <laughs> no. Um, that'll, be, that'll be great at some point in this episode. I want to talk about time management because you do have a lot going on. Uh, and I find myself in a very similar position. And you know, delegating tasks, even just to yourself and prioritizing and time management is just critical when you want to get all of these things done, stay organized and do it effectively. And, uh, there's no way to do it with just kind of like shooting from the hip. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so, uh, real quick jumping into your past, were you always a farmer? Like you didn't, uh, no. was, what, you know, did you, are you a 10th generation urban farmer or is this something you found later in life? Um, no, I have Absolutely zero background in agriculture. I have zero background in gardening. I um, did not know anything about agriculture until I started to really get interested in potentially being a farmer myself. I was really attracted to the, I'm sure, the common romanticism that a lot of your listeners might um, uh, empathize with or resonate with is that, you know, you look at problems in the world and you go, oh my God, you know, if I could just live off the land, I could solve so many problems, at least for myself. And, and, that, and that's where I was. Um, kind of a long story, but I, like you, I'm an avid cyclist. And I, um, I, I had been a working musician for most of my um, teen and adult life up until I was about 28, 29. And I was living in the city of Montreal. And I became, started to just see this sort of dystopian future for uh, people on this planet. And I didn't really feel like I was doing anything to contribute to that, being a musician. And so I got really interested in living off the land and, and all kinds of stuff, permaculture and biointensive farming and um, eco-villages and all kinds of things like this. And I did, a, I did a, a bike tour down the West Coast where I was sort of a, it was sort of a self-discovery thing. I rode from Kelowna, which is just four hours north of the Washington border, I rode all the way down to Tijuana and I visited off-grid homesteads and eco-villages and organic farms along the way. And I didn't really learn much about farming in that time. But what I did learn is that if you wear your values on your sleeve and you're prepared to go out in the world and show a bit of vulnerability and, and, um, and connect with people, people will come to you because they'll see what you're doing and they'll be inspired by your actions. And so by the time I finished my trip, down that, that west coast, I was very inspired to just do something. At, at that point, I wasn't exactly sure what it was, but I knew it, would want, it was going to be, be something to do with farming, but I didn't discover ur- urban farming really until I came back, and then I was really looking into that, and I was seeing other people doing it, going on YouTube, and, and just getting really inspired by that, and I decided that I would just try it and go for it and see what happens. No, that's really awesome. Uh, my wife and I went from New York City to Seattle to San Diego for 5,500 miles. We were wow. on bikes for almost a year because we would stop wow. and work on a farm for a week here or stop at a brewery for a weekend there. And yep. we were picking up farming knowledge along the way, but that really ended up exactly like you said, not being what the trip was about. The trip was about self-discovery, you know, being open and vulnerable and sharing that with other people and just, you know, people ask me what the biggest takeaway from the trip was. And for me, it was that, 
people are genuinely good. Like at Absolutely. heart, at the core of all these different demographics, there's good people everywhere. And if you open yourself up, tell your story and say, I don't know really where I'm going, but it's not really about the destination. It's about the journey and people are yes. like, yeah, this is great. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And that has transpired for me in life. And um, w when I finished that tour, I said to myself that I never wanted to go back to being the way I was and just sort of accepting this determinism thing, which, which was something that I believed in for a long time, being sort of a Marxist Leninist type person. I really believed in this determinism thing that, you know, you're born into a certain socioeconomic st place. That's kind of your place. Um, you are a certain race, that's your place, a certain gender, whatever it was. I didn't want to, I didn't accept that because I, I saw so many people on that trip that were just living by, um, by the hilt and uh, women and all kinds of other people that I wouldn't imagine. I thought that I'd just meet a bunch of guys on that tour, but I met people from all over the world with all kinds of different backgrounds that were just doing this thing and I was really inspired by that. And since since that trip, I've kind of just kept that in my life and said that I would never want to go back to being the way I was and just just kind of slogging through life and you know working a job I hate just to pay the bills so that I can be a weekend warrior. So I didn't I I didn't want to accept that any longer and just sort of was an arrogant confidence. <laughs> yeah, went into this farming thing, and all I really wanted to do was scratch out a living at the beginning. Was you know if I could, I was looking at certain models. I was interested in Elliot Coleman's work. And then I became interested in spin farming. And I was thinking, okay, you know, I'll start on a half acre. That's what I had at the time. Um, if I could scratch out 20, if I could make 20 grand a year, that'd be enough. I mean, when I was living in Montreal as a musician, I was living on $16,000 a year. Mm -hmm. like I was totally comfortable living under the, the said poverty line, which in our, in our world is still pretty comfortable. So, you know, I was prepared to do that. And it, and it, I, I made money that first year. I made 22000 my first year, doubled down on the things that worked. And that kind of became a theme for me going forward is that I kept just focusing on the things that worked and eliminating the things that didn't. And that's not to say that I didn't keep making mistakes because I, I absolutely did. Made some epic mistakes, but I continued, just, just pushed on and, and went with what worked. Oh, there's absolutely no end to the mistakes. And year to year, you'll get one thing right and you'll still make mistakes because there's that variability of nature and you're still learning and adapting and your situation is constantly changing, even if you're on the same piece of land. Like we had a drought here all summer and that changed things from last year that, you know, could have been just, you know, the same wake up, this is what you do and this is the end. And then you wake up and it's different because there's a new variable and now you have to adjust and there's always mis lessons to be learned and mistakes to be made for sure. Absolutely. I also really love your approach on not being set in that one, um, you know, plot in life of, all right, you wake up, your parents are this way, you have to be that way, that's the way you're going to live, and that's the way you're going to die. And that is actually one of the major themes that I try to approach in farming is that I really don't like, although it, it fits a lot of times, but when people go, oh, you want to get into farming, oh, you'll be poor for the rest of your life. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I'm so drawn to you and JM and Diego is that here you have this proven model of no, you don't have to, you know, you for the beginning, it's any small business you have, you know, there's reinvesting in the business and being having thin margins and figuring stuff out and reinvesting and blah, blah. But getting to a point where you can be profitable, you can have a, a better lifestyle and you know, make money farming. It's okay to mm -hmm. make money farming. You don't have to accept that like, oh yeah, I'm going to work my butt off and have a second job just so I can be a farmer. That if you adjust what you're doing, find those profitable things, double down on what's working, you can have a lifestyle where you make a little bit of money and that is not a dirty thing to do. Not at all. And, and that's one of the biggest things that keeps people, holds people down in this space, especially in like the permaculture arena is that for one, the guilt of, making money, but also the deterministic thing of, oh, well, this is the status quo and this is just how it's going to be. As soon as you admit those things, you've already failed because you've accepted this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. And I don't care what anybody says about that because I have seen 
people that have met every challenge that they've faced in their life. And yeah, some people have it harder than others, right? Some, some people grow up poorer than I did, or they grow up with a physical or mental disability. But I have been shown time and time again that the self-determination of the strong individual who doesn't accept their determinism and pushes through often becomes more successful than the people that might have started with some privilege because they came in with the right at the with the right attitude and work ethic and pushed through all these things like for example I have some friends that I grew up with who like I grew up in the lower middle class area of my town uh, all my friends growing up were raised by single mothers and we were all little troublemaking boys that were getting arrested and and doing drugs and we 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 had a pretty tough upbringing uh being bullied and and a lot of violence in our life um but i had friends that grew up on the upside of the hill who had a lot more money and grew up with all kinds of opportunities the university paid for all kinds of connections and all these things but today as we stand um right now the people that I, I knew, the, f- the few that I knew that climbed out of that poverty, poverty have done far more in their life and have become far more successful because they came in and they worked hard. And I think um, a bit of struggle, a little bit of resistance um, builds what, we, you know, anti-fragility. You know, a bit of stress on something makes things stronger. It's like that old, that old saying, if you um, what doesn't kill you make you strong makes you stronger, and so I, I really believe that that some of that some of those things are necessary to build strong characters and people that do epic things in the world. Is you need some a, a bit of uh, a bit of resistance against you. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of phrases and old adages of you know like the strongest steel goes through the hottest fire, and then ties into agriculture where you're hardening your plants off. You know, if you water your plants every single day, they'll develop shallow root systems and you'll have to water every day. But if you give them a little bit of stress, they dig a little bit deeper and then you have more resilient plants that are stronger on the other end and you're going to do more and do better uh, because of that stress. Absolutely. Yeah. What, what, What is true in nature is true in the mind. It's also true in the body. All of these things are connected. We are nature and um, our minds are an ecosystem. And I believe that the, the marketplace is the ecosystem that our minds connect in because we either decide to voluntarily work with each other or involuntarily be subjected or, or um, oppressed by somebody else. So I think all these things are connected. They're all, it's all a result of nature. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's the not putting too much stress on where you end up uh, in the fetal position on your kitchen floor sobbing because you're too <laughs> tired to make yourself dinner and uh, it was funny to hear you describe that because I had a podcast episode uh, a month or two ago where I had that same episode like in my kitchen, just too tired and too weary and couldn't couldn't face it anymore that day and just broke down because I had, you know, you, you get into the point where you've exercised, you're f- working on farm, you feel physically fit, you feel on top of what you're doing, stuff goes wrong, but it's okay because you've learned all this stuff about being agile and pivoting. And you're just putting your heart and soul into what you do and thing after thing presents a, you know, a new level of difficulty. And at some point, unless you regularly schedule in some time to just clear your mind and rest your body, if you have too much stress, it can go the other way and just end in cat- catastrophe. Absolutely. And I've been there uh, many times, especially in my, my formative years of farming uh, probably looking back in 20 years, I'll still still look at right now. This is my sixth. This is my sixth season that I just finished as my formative years of farming. But the first three, actually, in fact, the first four years were extremely difficult. My third year of farming was actually was okay. I had a system. I was still small, but the year that I grew, I quadrupled the size of my farm in one year. Took on partners. Took on a bunch of staff was incredibly trying. I had a relationship that tanked. The, the partnership fell apart. Everything in my world collapsed at once, and it was extremely difficult. It tested me beyond anything that I'd ever been tested in before. And I came out of it stronger, happier, a better farmer, 
and a better business person. And I'm, I'm so thankful for those experiences and I have no regrets as far as uh, the way that things have gone with my farm. No, you really can't regret anything as you look back because you have to know that as you looked back, you made the best decision you could at the time with the information you had at hand. And at that time, it looked like the right thing to do or felt like the right thing to do or on paper or in real life seemed like the thing to do. And, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty. It's easy to look back and say, oh, yeah, I can't believe I made this mistake or, oh, yeah, if only this person had done this. You did the best you could. You learned from it. And that's what the value you in particular bring to the Urban Farmer Show and your profitable urban farming course is that you've made those mistakes. You've been curled up on the floor crying and you're here on the other <laughs> side to talk about it. Cause it, well, yeah, I've suffered. It's hard, man. Basically. <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's the thing. And, and that's what more people need to do is you must simulate because trial and error sucks. It <laughs> yeah. Sucks. It's awful. You know, do not try to reinvent the wheel. Look at who, has done something and build off of that. We got to make the 2.0s and the 3.0s. Don't start with the beta testing. Get it going, building off the, uh, well, there's that saying, building on the shoulders of giants. Build off the information that's already out there. Look at who's successful. Glean what you want. You might listen to some of what I say. You might not agree with some of what, what I say. That's totally fine. But glean what you can from it and leverage that and move forward and build off those experiences because I don't want anybody to go through the things that I had to go through when I started. I absolutely suffered my way through the first few years. And um, I'm happy as hell that I'm not in that phase anymore because I, I, <laughs> yeah. I remember even in my first year just just working so hard, so physically hard, just thinking, oh, God, I can't wait until I'm like year five in this and it's easier. And, and then looking back, I often have this, it's like I'm, I'm connecting to my past and just imagining where my mind was back then. And it's almost like I've gone back in time and looking at myself in a third person view. <laughs> yeah. Going, wow. Remember how difficult this used to be? <laughs> it's now like, because now I can, with, with 10 hours of work on my farm, I can do the same amount of work that would have taken me 40 or 50 hours before. Mm -hmm. And that's, that has a lot to do with you leveraging time as passive techniques, leveraging proper, appropriate technology. And also using just better techniques. Yeah, absolutely. And embracing all the information that is out there, that any topic that you could possibly want to learn, you know, you can YouTube a video, you can find a book, you can find some forum where people are talking about it and the internet becomes such a friend that, like you said earlier, glean what, what really strikes home for you or solves your problem in the moment and, you know, listen to some of that other stuff that you maybe you know, you may be headed towards that track of, of burnout or success, you know, it doesn't have to be negative. Um, but listening to other people's case studies, now that more of them are being shared online, and realizing, all right, take away the fact that that person's a beef farmer, and just think about what in their go what they're going through in their business. And notice that there are similarities in your vegetable growing, and you can apply those, you know, general philosophies or principles to your business. And that it, it's amazing that we're at a place now where farmers can be so active about sharing those stories. Absolutely. Um, a word of caution, though, as well, is that there is a lot of BS out there. Yeah. And, and uh, you have to be careful online a little bit because you can go down a rabbit hole on YouTube. And I did. And I tried many things that did not work for me. Because the thing that you have to take into consideration, John, is that farming is very dependent on geography De customer demographics and conditions, social conditions in your area. So what might work exactly for me might not work exactly for you. So there's always those variables. And I think it's important to really look at things on a little bit more of a macro level than a, a totally micro level. Unless we're talking about something like washing carrots. Okay, here's, I got a great technique on how to wash carrots in my online course. Okay, that will work for everybody. But um, well, more or less, but, uh, the crops, the exact crops that I grow to the, the same kind of customers that I sell to might not work in your area. So it's always important to kind of keep that in mind when, when you're trying to glean information from other people that, okay, think about this in my situation and how does it work there? Yeah, that's absolutely true because, 
You know, I I read a lot of you know I've I read a lot of what um, we had a uh, episode on this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we called them BS artists, uh, and there was just a lot of shenanigans online. And it wasn't it wasn't necessarily that they were putting out bad information. It's taking into perspective of how you digest that information, and that's that's tough to do, and that's a hyper personal thing that you can read Joel Salatin's Pastured Poultry Profits and think, all right. Now that I have this book, this manual, I'm going to go out and make, you know, $60,000 a year on 20 acres of borrowed land or whatever the numbers work out to be. Or even your course of $75,000 on a third of an acre, you have to take stock of your perspective on, you know, are you going to put in this amount of time? Do you have that access? A lot of the um, minute details that you share about urban farming, I have a 50 acre rural farm and getting rid of like the pat, the room in between rows of my plantings, like there's still a lot of mowing to do because I have 50 acres and there's a property to manage and not all of the specific items I can apply to my farm, but some of a lot of the general principles I can. And that's mm-hmm. where it's really started to translate into my 50 acre plus uh, rural farm, taking these urban farming principles and then applying them here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly. So we've uh, we've nailed down some really good farm philosophy. Uh, let's get into a little bit of if you can give me like two or three of your most productive, efficient tips for farming, and then I'd love to know dig in a little bit on how you're tracking things, just some of the technology you use on farm. I'm a tech and gadget geek, uh, so I'd really love to drill into that. But what are some things that you noticed from being a we'll say comparatively larger farmer? when you had a staff and business partners that really have changed into your uh, urban farming model? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, It's kind of a big one, so I'll try to... It is kind of a broad. But but, I mean, one one thing was is that... And I'm trying to... How do I preliminarily set this up? So when I was farming more broad, we were growing 80 types of vegetables, you know, pretty much every every type of annual vegetable that I could grow in my growing climate, we were growing because we had a but an eighty member CSA, and we sold to a lot of restaurants that year and big restaurants, and we also did two farmers markets a week. So we were growing a, a wide <laughs> a wide variety of crops, and the idea there is is to 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 capture more market share because when I tell people, look, farming with my model exactly like what I'm doing here with green city acres, we can do 75 grand or more on a third of an acre. That doesn't necessarily scale. That doesn't necessarily mean you can take 75,000 times three or times six and you'll make the same amount of money on that much more land. It doesn't really work that way because it's all about market saturation. So the broader you go in your farm, the broader you have to go with your products and, and even your customer base. You need to have a more diversified customer base. The smaller you go, the more focused you can be because you're catering to a, a, a you're, you're niching further and further down the line. And so I find your dollar per square foot goes up as you like per capita. The smaller you go, and your dollar per square foot goes down the larger you go. And there's sort of an, a, a sweet spot that you can find that is maximizing on both those. It's sort of where the crosshairs meet. And you've got the highest amount of marketability and the highest amount of profitability with the least amount of labor. Uh, I've found that to be a third of an acre on my farm. So when we were growing, you know, all these different types of crops, I put all this stuff in a spreadsheet at the end of that year, and it was an incredibly trying year because the partnership kind of fell apart. But but in a good way, like we're all still friends, and 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 I wish them all the best, and and we're all we all still help each other in the community. Um, but the things that I discovered was, oh my God, look at our crop selection, put it all on a spreadsheet, and I discovered there was 10 crops that made most of the money of that farm. Because in that one particular year, we were still multi-locational. We had a two-acre site, which most of the long season and even medium season production was. And then we had, a, across the street from that, we had about a quarter acre, and then the rest of it was all in urban lots. In that particular year, we had a hailstorm that wiped out that entire two-acre field in a half an hour. Oh. We had hail the size of golf balls, and at, when we went out after the storm happened, it looked like somebody had taken a weed whacker through our lettuce, shredded our squash. Our, all of our outside field tomatoes were pummeled 
we had $30,000 of crop damage in a half an hour. But in that year, for the period of time that, like, and, and it, some of it regenerated, quite a bit of it regenerated, lost the whole, the tomato, the outside tomatoes were a complete loss. Um, most of the head lettuce was a complete loss, which was a lot. But um, the urban plots carried the farm for those three weeks of regeneration. And so it means our, our CSA changed a little bit and our, and our customers were very empathetic and understanding of the situation. And that's kind of what's great about a CSA. But I discovered that the, the fact that I, my farm is multi-locational, that it's diversified in location. And that was a, that's a strategic advantage there. And the fact that these high value crops grow so quickly that even if they were to get um, damaged by some of the weather, the next week there's new ones coming on because the, the turnover is so high. So the lessons there for, for me was that um, there was a, a lot of value in growing those types of crops. And this is specific to my, my geography and also the, my customer demand. There's a lot of demand for those products that I could scale back to those just those things. And so right now I, I pretty much grow about 10 types of crops, maybe a little bit more. Um, if you include like a few different varieties, like say golden beets or red beets and yep. things like that, uh, it, may, may, it might be around 30 crops really, but, um, it's really like 10 types of crops that I grow. And I've just found that that works so much better for my size of farm where we leverage our labor. And there's some crops that, uh, are very uneconomical to grow in an intensive system. So for example, growing potatoes in an intensive farming system because we don't have a tractor. Right? Yeah, Our yeah. Farm is behind. We, so you, you have to have hand dig all of that. Yeah, it's so much labor and it's really hard physical labor that those kind of things are just better grown with a tractor. Yeah, and while like digging potatoes is one of my more favorite activities and it's a lot of fun, like it's a lot of fun yes, for one 40-foot row once Absolutely. a season. <laughs> I love it. I love it too. But if you had to do hundreds of rows by hand, it just doesn't work out when you can harvest microgreens at a much faster rate and get a much higher dollar for them. Because even if your potatoes are worth more grown however you've grown them, there's still a market perception on what people are willing to pay for a potato. Exactly. And and what it also is, too, on my end is that I I discovered kind of by force, just default, the fact that my farm is so small and I wanted to keep growing some crops is that I was in a way forced into interplanting things and experimenting a lot with that. And that's been able, uh, I've been able to overlap production times of certain things so that there is very little time um, in any point in our season where each piece of land um, is, isn't growing something. Where it, The farm is always in production. By mid-May, Every single bed on my farm has been planted at least once, and everything is into a, uh, is in a state of rotation. So, Curtis, it's been an awesome episode talking to you right now. A lot of farm philosophy, more than I had figured, and all of it really good. And has you know that's exactly what's been on my mind lately. I want to bring you on again in the next episode to talk about how you do your record keeping, how what technology you use on phone or on farm. I know you use your phone a lot, which is why I think it slipped. Um, and just how you, how do you manage several different plots with all these different rotations and quick crops? And you get the point here. So before next episode, plug away, where can we find out more information if we just can't wait to hear more about Curtis Stone? Yeah. Check out my, the website for my book is the urban farmer.co. The, my online course that I offer, um, which is an extensive, it took two and a half years to build. It's a fully multimedia experience. You have access to it for life and we are updating it now. It's got head cam footage of every single thing I do on the farm. It's got interviews for everything we do on the farm. Uh, it's got a spreadsheet calculator that calculates everything you need as far as seed and how to plan your farm. Uh, that's profitable urban Uh, we host, uh, monthly, open to the public webinars. So if anybody wants to, is curious about what we do, we usually do them on Sundays. So if they go, if they find us on Facebook at just profitable urban farming on Facebook, you'll find us. We have um, posts for our webinars there. They can check that out. If they want to learn more about my farm, go to greencityacres.com, but you're probably better off finding Green City Acres on Facebook because I haven't updated my website for the farm in a while. <laughs> and, um, 
yeah, that's about it. Yeah, and for all of you whose heads are spinning or your you know your pen is lighting on fire, I will have all of these links on the show notes for this episode over at farmmarketingsolutions.com. Curtis, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, love the information you dropped this time, and I'm looking forward to next episode, man. My pleasure, John. So that's it for episode number 81 of the Growing Farms podcast. I want to thank Curtis again for coming on the show sharing a lot of wisdom and a lot of good backstory on how we got into farming. You know, that's a lot of the interesting stuff to me is not necessarily just what people are producing, but how did they get there? What did they end up? What, how did they, you know, if we're supposed to be iterating year to year, where did you start to get where you are today? And I think we got that out of this episode. Out of the next episode, if you stay tuned and subscribe to the podcast until episode number 82, bringing Curtis back on, he's going to talk about some of his production methods, and he's going to talk about some of his information tracking and analysis. I always love those words because they sound so cold and dry and boring, but they get me so just jazzed is the word that I can think of, so riled up, so mm, yeah, love it. So episode 82, coming up in two weeks, we're on the every other week schedule for the podcast because the times are still really busy. If you get if you, if you can't get enough of, uh, of the farm marketing solutions-ness that is me, John Siskovich, uh, you can always head on over to youtube.com forward slash farm marketing or just Google farm marketing YouTube and it'll come up. If you can pretty much anything farm marketing, you can put farm marketing and then something after it into Google and something of mine will come up at this point. I think we're about three years in. So it's pretty fun. Curtis, thanks for coming on the show. I love that you'll be here next week <clears throat> or in the next two weeks. And uh, now time for that farm update that I promised you guys. So here on Camps Road Farm, the big news for the year is that I've had pigs all summer. And it was my first time raising pigs by myself, managing them by myself. I've been on farms that have raised pigs, but I was never this close and intimate with my pork. So had 12 pigs at the beginning of the year. Uh, we got rid of one pig at a USDA slaughtering facility that we used for a pig roast and hop harvest festival on the farm. That was a lot of fun. Uh, the festival and the pig roast. The pig roast was really amazing. Um, that I wasn't as connected to the end of that pig because I sent it out, you know, it goes into a room and I, I see it on the other end when it's cold and, you know, it looks like lunch more than it does a pig. But we had nine pigs processed on farm, slaughtered on farm. I had a friend, I have a friend of mine who is a professional butcher and slaughterer. Um, he comes to the farm, we'll say, we'll, say, we'll just leave it to butchering. The guy's name is Joe, came, comes to the farm, uh, shoots the animal, um, uh, guts the animal, skins the animal, and then we bring it to a custom butcher to fill in that custom butchering ag slaughter exemption here in Connecticut, where if someone buys the pig ahead of time, I can kill it on farm and bring it to a butcher and the sale is all legal and good. That for me, man, was that a new experience. So these things, these pigs had become kind of like pets. I got a little attached and seeing them shot in the head and then their throat cut that and then thrashing around for a couple minutes afterwards uh man that was really hard um yeah this is the first time i'm talking about it really out loud to anybody and it's on the podcast with you guys uh it's really hard but at the same time i really believe that humans should eat meat um i think you know we were we were born and bred and developed to do it and if we're going to eat meat being connected to our food chain, even if you're a vegetarian, being connected to your food chain and knowing where your food comes from and having this experience at least once in your life is very important. That's my personal opinion. Not everybody should see this every day. Uh, it's not for the, the weak of stomach or heart, but definitely something that I will, I'll know what's coming <laughs> uh, in the future. And I know my friend Ethan Book has a you know, has a diversified farm uh, over, you know, the beginning farmer show, but concentrates, you know, his main enterprises on pig and bringing pigs to the locker now has probably become second nature to him uh, or you other pig farmers who are listening. But these, you know, these nine pigs that we put down on farm uh, and processed here, that was a really big event for me. And that was the, you know, as I look back in the last couple of weeks on 
really what stands out on farm as a major thing, that was definitely it. You know, we've raised them in a really good way. I've detailed all of that on YouTube. I know I've plugged my YouTube thing like 19 times on this episode, and I'm sorry for that, but I'm, I'm really into the video creation these days. But that was my big thing. So the, the pigs, we marketed by the half. We had customers buy a half a pig. They're going to pick it up from the locker, uh, all cut up to their specifications from their cut sheets, and life is good. We're saving back two pigs that we're going to use for brewery events, uh, we do a lot of food events that do food and beer pairing. So we'll be able to offer, you know, we've had a lot of chicken, <laughs> a lot of chicken and beer pairings. Now we have uh, some beer and pork pairings coming up in the future, which will be really, really fantastic. Other things that I've been doing on farm, um, still a lot of activity, a lot of going out, cleaning things up, getting things ready for the winter. Today, uh, as I record this podcast, we went out in all 24 chicken tractors. We took the tarps out. We took the feeders out. We took the waters out. We cleaned them out, folded up the tarps, and stored everything safe and dry and locked down for the winter so it's not outside getting tattered and torn. That kind of stuff is what we've been doing on farm. That, and I've been doing some more reading and research to make my farm a better place. Talked about it in the beginning of this episode. Some of that reading and research, well, a lot of it I do at night. Before I go to bed, my day is still consumed with doing things on the farm, but I have been versus in the summer when it's all production and harvest based work, I've been able to get some education, visit some other farms and farmers and bring some of that information back to my farm, always striving to make it a better place. And that's the final, the final beat to the drum that I'm going to have for this episode You know, that standing on the shoulders of giants, building on the shoulders of giants. I guess I'll just say both until I figure out what the phrase is. But that's, you can be your own giant. This is not something where you have to start a farm marketing solutions blog or you have to start some big internet presence or put all this extra work in. Doing your own record keeping so that year to year, you know where you were what worked and what didn't, so you have a better idea, a more educated idea of where you're going in the future. And that is going to be what I'm going to be talking about all winter long. And we're going to look at my sheets from the year, what I did right, what I did wrong, and we're going to analyze, break it down. I want my farm, and it's all right with everybody else who works with me on farm, to become a really good case study on, you know, it's, yeah, I tried my best the first couple of years and you make mistakes. And you iterate and you share knowledge and you make things better and it becomes a place that the end goal, what I want to see for my farm and even farm marketing solutions is a very efficiently run, very fun place to work that all the questions are easy to answer, uh, the ones that are easy to answer. Uh, We have our system set up and it's an example for other people that want to get into farming or want to make their existing farm better. Is that a lofty goal? Absolutely. You know, the, the, the best way to achieve something great is to, you know, aim high. I mean, one of my favorite quotes early on, and maybe this is my quote that I end the episode with, it's one that you guys have heard before. Uh, it's from Leonard Bernstein. He says to achieve great things, two things are needed, a plan and not quite enough time. I have a plan. I know what I need to do. I'm learning more things, but there's never enough time. And so it's just making the best decisions I can make now with the knowledge I have at hand and being open to iterating, taking notes and building on what I have achieved in the past. I'm excited to be on this ride with you guys. It's three years in on the podcast. If my math is right here, that's really crazy to think that it's three years, three years into the the podcast. I'm still excited about how new of a farmer I am, how much I've learned so far. Definitely night and day difference from when I was first starting out, and I have so far to go. Thanks for following along. Thanks for participating. Please go check out The Urban Farmer uh, on the Permaculture Voices podcast because you will be happy that you did. Plus, it'll fill all the time in that you'll need before you see me in two weeks when the next podcast episode comes out. Thanks for taking the time to listen. I know your time is valuable, very important. And until next time, I will see you out in the field. Thank you for listening to the Growing Farms podcast brought to you by Farm Marketing Solutions at www.farmmarketingsolutions.com. 